So I have received what I have received from God completely as a gracious transaction to me. It's not, ba it's not, a, it's not it's a, a gift. It's not a let's make a deal. Yeah. I don't say to God, okay, I'm going to do my part. And then God says to me, okay, I'm going to do my part. And then we shake hands in the middle of the table and we say, we've got a deal. If that's your view of salvation, you don't understand it. Salvation is completely one way. God gives me something that I don't deserve. I receive it as a gift. And the only way, by the way, according to Romans 4, verse 5, you can receive a gift from God is by faith alone, which means to trust. Is by grace through faith. Grace through faith. Ephesians says, right? That's exactly right. I receive that, and then I spend the rest of my life figuring out what I have in my spiritual bank account, and I say, I just can't believe what God has given me. Mm. I've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and so Romans 12, around verse 1, says, I respond in the reasonable way, the only reasonable way I could, I just offer my body to Him, and I say, Lord, do what you want in my body. I'm not doing that out of fear that maybe I'm not one of the elect, fear that maybe I'm not going to heaven. Those are all illegitimate motivations. I do it because I'm sure of what I have. I can't believe what I have, and the only thing I know how to do that's reasonable is to offer my body as a living sacrifice. So we believe that this doctrine of grace unleashes Christian service and holiness in daily life and does not destroy it. And this is very important because they will accuse us of being antinomian. Rejecting the law. Yeah, against the law, namas meaning law, that we're just teaching this doctrine, oh, you're saved, go send up a storm. No, we're if, not saying if, that. If we they... started out the broadcast refuting that. Chris and a lot of legalistic Christians seem to think if you say that we're saved by grace, that we're saying it's okay to sin, when that's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is that when you fall short and you do sin, you don't lose your salvation because it's not your good behavior that saves you anyway. It's putting your faith and trust in the blood Jesus shed that saves you. But of course that doesn't mean we get a free license to openly sin. Paul tells us in Romans 6, 15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. And if you do stumble across a Christian who does say, it's okay to sin, then I would question if they were in fact an actual believer. Because when we believe, we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And when you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, yeah, you may still struggle at times with sin, bad habits, and your flesh, but you're not going to revel in your sin. The Holy Spirit will not allow us to enjoy sin. Ephesians 1.13 and 14 says, In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Think about what Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's all about Jesus Christ. And sanctification is a process. We are justified and then we are sanctified. Paul said that he had a thorn in his side. Um, it was the spirit of infirmity. He also said that he didn't understand himself because he didn't do the things that he wanted to do and he found himself doing the things that he didn't want to do. When I was born again, it took years for me to quit smoking cigarettes and it was by a nicotine replacement program i'm still addicted to nicotine and i have been slowly weaning off of it the lord delivered me from tobacco and from smoking actual cigarettes but it's been it's been a process of of sanctification things have been falling off and let me tell you where i came from where the what the lord pulled me out of when I gave my life to him. I was a coke addict. I was addicted to coke. I was addicted to Mr. Pibb. I was addicted to opiates. And there was one week in particular that I spent $1,400 on cocaine. I also had a man who I exchanged I, I prostituted myself for cocaine, even though the Lord delivered me from all drugs, all alcohol. I still smoked for a very long time. And it took a lot of prayer. I prayed all the time 
all the time. And it was like, you know, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm a hypocrite sitting here, you know, smoking right now. And I kept praying and praying and praying. And I'm like, you know, I felt like Paul. I find myself doing the things I don't want to do and not doing the things that I want to do. When I was still smoking cigarettes, and as of right now, um, using a, a nicotine replacement program, I am saved and born again. I am saved. I am sealed until the day of redemption. A, a, a gift so I can't boast. You know, where I've come from is insane. And I know there's so many other people who have also experienced similar amazing, um, amazing changes in their life when they have come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Things start to fall off. Sanctification is a process. All of the glory for every single change, every single turnaround in my life is because of him, not because of me. And I know that the Lord will deliver me from nicotine entirely. My righteousness and your righteousness is as filthy rags. And when we enter the kingdom of heaven and we are glorified along with Jesus Christ, then we will, everything will fall off. I have, even with, you know, me trying so hard, I have committed adultery because I've thought about men lustfully. I have murdered my brother because I have been mad at people in my heart. I'm not perfect. And I, the huge difference is I don't want to sin. It feels horrible when I sin. But look at where I was and where I am now. Now, according to Chris, this girl's salvation is uncertain because she's still struggling with addiction, even though the Holy Spirit empowered her to overcome drug addictions and has helped her cut down on her nicotine habit. But since nicotine is still a struggle for her, that's a sign she isn't fully surrendered and is walking in disobedience. Therefore, she needs to be worried about her salvation because Chris doesn't understand the difference between salvation and sanctification. He doesn't understand that different Christians are in different places than other Christians. Some are way ahead and others are way behind. But we all have different journeys. You can't look at a Christian and judge them solely based on their actions or appearance. Because you don't know where they started or where they're from and what they've already overcome and what work the Holy Spirit is doing in them. Sure, you can easily spot baby Christians or weak Christians based on their actions, but instead of condemning them, we should encourage them and motivate them and remind them what Jesus did on the cross for us. And since he gave us his all, we should give him ours as well. And that should resonate with any Holy Spirit sealed believer. The Bible says we should examine ourselves to make sure we're in the faith. So we're not saying don't ever take a spiritual inventory. What we're saying is you don't have to run around all the time doubting your salvation because today you didn't surrender to Christ in, in certain areas where you should have. You got angry. You didn't surrender your pride and you got angry. You didn't surrender your pride and you're impatient. You didn't surrender your greed and you thought about uh, a deal that you put through that wasn't looking out for the best interest of someone else. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean you lost your salvation. It just means you need to continue on the process of sanctification. They would yeah. accuse us of easy believism, but have you heard any easy believism here? But they'd well, accuse us of that, wouldn't they? Well, I'd like, to, I'd like to ask them a question. Where do you find the word easy believism in the Bible? You either believe or you don't. Believe means trust. So the Bible says you either believe or you don't believe. There's no, this, this charge of easy believism is just something what well, we've also have manufactured. We've also we've also been accused of denying the biblical gospel because we don't agree with their extreme Calvinism or their definitions of Savior Lord. We've been accused of undermining the gospel and all kinds of other things. So again, instead of showing where we're wrong, they just offer up insults. You know, we're denying the gospel, it's the other way around. We're defending the gospel. These folks are out here adding conditions to the gospel and teaching works. And neither one of us is denying that a true believer will make Christ their Lord and their Savior. What we're, de what we're disagreeing with is the definition of those terms. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah, correct. And what we're disagreeing with is when those things happen. 
they're taking things that are necessary for growth. They're taking things that are about sanctification and applying them to justification. And that's what we call front loading. Okay. And see, that's no small thing. Because now if you're not careful, you're going to have a different gospel. You've just added a condition Works. beyond faith alone. Now that puts a person under the curse of Galatians 1, 6 through 9, where Paul pronounced an anathema. These are not my words, folks. This is what Paul said. An anathema on those who teach a different gospel. It's a very, very serious issue. I mean, if anybody adds anything to salvation, justification, by faith alone, by Christ alone, based on the authority of the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone, it doesn't matter how popular they are, it doesn't matter how many books they've written, it doesn't matter how well they sound, but they are under the curse of Galatians 1. Mm -hmm. Very serious issue. Galatians 1, 8, 9 says, But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel to you than that you have received, let him be accursed. And this is where the tables turn on legalistic preachers like Chris who run around preaching hellfire and brimstone out of context and not realizing they're placing themselves under a curse from God by altering the true gospel. The ones who follow Chris are confused and full of fear because they've been deceived by a false gospel, a false gospel that Chris Lasala spreads. List your weaknesses. I'm lazy. I'm tired. I'm bitter. I'm depressed. They're all demons. You don't sleep. A real Christian doesn't sleep. I'm tired. I'm... They're all demons. So tiredness is caused by demons? Let me make sure I'm understanding this right. A real Christian doesn't sleep, nor do they tire. And if they do become tired, it's not because they haven't slept. No, no, that can't be it. It's because they have a demon. <laughs> yes, this is in fact what he is teaching. You have to be under some serious mind control to even entertain the absurdity of these nonsensical concepts that he keeps spewing out. And Chris, even if this is something you genuinely believe, it's not something to preach from behind the pulpit because now you're laying a heavy burden on your congregation and your listeners that are going to make them feel like less of a Christian because they get tired and sleep. And now when they hear this, some of them probably try to force themselves to sleep very little. And then when they inevitably become tired, they think it's because they have demons. So, <laughs> way to discourage your cult following. I'm tired. I'm... They're all demons. So, if I went outside and took a jog around my neighborhood and became tired, would that be a demon? A real Christian doesn't sleep. Can I get a show of hands from... All of the real Christians out there who don't sleep? A real Christian doesn't sleep. 